All right. Welcome, everybody. It feels like a, a while since I've gotten to do one of these, um, which is great. Uh, well, it's great for y'all. Uh, kind of sad for me because I don't get to see everybody as, as often, um, and I, I enjoy this. So um, we're going to be talking about summer plants, things that look great during the summer. Uh, I've picked out a few things, but I'll also kind of be freewheeling it a little bit. Uh, and so if you have questions about something that's uh, that we're passing by, uh, feel free to ask me um, about it. Uh, I love to, you know, I could do an hour and a half within, you know, five feet uh, of here. So uh, I'm happy to talk about anything. Um, do ask that I, I try and be in places where we can we can gather around, um, I, you know, ask people stay off the uh, the out of the beds if possible um we've got a lot of little things in there that might not be up uh we're always trying to really improve our soils so um you know when we stand on there it kind of compacts it down and um little feet and big feet so uh we try uh, try to stay out um while i'm talking if you have a different experience with the plant while i talk about how easy it is and how great it is um, if you've had a different experience please um, let us know because uh I'm, I'm, or if you think i'm wrong uh please uh pipe up because we love to hear um different experiences in the garden so with that we're gonna we're gonna move a bit to get to our first spot and uh then we'll from there we'll we've got kind of a steady stream of things so we're gonna go around uh behind the visitor center and around this is one of my well i won't this is one of my favorite plants boy it's been too long since i've said that on a tour um, <laughs> so this is a, a loquat uh eriobetria japonica um Area Batria uh, translate. Area means woolly, and uh, Batria um, means uh, clustered. So woolly clusters, and it gets that name because uh, the new growth um, and often the leaves come out covered in real dense uh, 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 pubescence or, or hairs on them. Uh, it's kind of rusty brown. One of my favorite words that I learned back in botany is ferruginous, means it's covered with rusty brown hairs, uh, like the backside of, of Southern Magnolia, ferruginous. Um, this is a, an unnamed uh, selection with this speckled foliage, uh, which I find very, very attractive. Um, we just call it white splashed. Uh, it's it's one we got in Japan from a little nursery called Chicory Nursery, which has the most fantastic things in there. Uh, and I was so excited. Uh, actually, when I got this plant, I was so excited because uh, they saw me trying to write down names of things. And they came through and wrote little tags with the name of everything on it. Uh, I got it back here and I was looking at what those names meant to translate them and realized they were just, it was like loquat, akuba, whatever, just in Japanese. And I was really hoping to get a cultivar name for them. So uh, there are a couple different uh, variegated loquats around. There's the splashed one. There's also a white edged one and one that's more uh, creamy yellow edge. Uh, they're all great in my mind. Um, loquats uh, come are from, say, south central uh, uh, China, not not as deep south as people believe, kind of thing, and they grow in kind of middle elevations. They don't love it like down in Florida, um, but they're really kind of zone eight. A 7B hardy, depending on uh, the selection. There's about a hundred different cultivars for fruit in in China, uh, though. So there's quite a lot, but but they like cooler temperatures, but not real cold, um, and so are are pretty good for us here. Kind of unusual with fruiting plants because they flower in fall and winter with kind of these fuzzy white uh, flowers that are super fragrant in, in clusters and uh, then form their fruit over the winter and are usually ripe in uh, kind of mid spring when we don't have a lot of tree fruits uh, ripening. Uh, of course, that means for us here, 
a lot of times the flowers get frozen, the fruit gets frozen. So it's really a matter of, of you know, getting the right selections that will have fruit. We haven't gotten fruit on these variegated ones yet. It'd be really interesting because this should be some, this should be fairly heritable. So uh, if we sowed these, we would expect to get some, uh, some variegated ones um, out of that. Um, they can grow into pretty decent tr sized trees and get 30, 40 feet tall, but usually in cultivation, they're more like 12 or 15 feet. Um, you can see this has been fine. It was planted as a, as a really small uh, plant. The other odd thing about this particular selection, and I've seen this in a few of these variegated plants, is the first flush comes out heavily variegated. The next flush over the summer will come out not variegated at all. It'll be, they'll be pretty much completely green. And these will darken to this nice green. And you can see the old foliage uh, is, is green, uh, which is kind of a, I find that kind of interesting that it layers itself like that. So that's part of why I like it, because it's such a weird kind of uh, 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 variegation. Completely stable. I've never seen one of these revert at all. Um, I love pots. I've got a plain one um, planted at a really, uh, in a really kind of prominent spot in my garden. Uh, and I, I was just out yesterday looking at it. It's just beautiful right now, like the dark green foliage. Um, I've got several, very, I've got the white edged one in a pot right by my front door. I've got a little one of these planted kind of in what will be a prominent spot, but it's about this big now and surrounded by uh, cycad foliage, dead cycad foliage, because my neighbor's dogs like to run through my beds and they keep kept hitting it and knocking it out of the, the, the ground. I find them to be extremely drought tolerant, which is nice, um, but they respond well to, to good moisture. Um, they'll grow quicker that way, but that's the reason I have one in a, a container is because I can kind of forget about watering it and it does well. Fruit, if you haven't eaten loquat fruit, it is delicious, uh, kind of depending on selection, but kind of sweet, uh, acidic um, uh, fruit. Uh, it turns a little orange, so it's, it's, it's real pretty um, uh, fruit. I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, really a, uh, just a lovely little plant. It, do, it is a plant that kind of symbolizes wealth in, in uh, Asia, so you a lot of times have one planted in the garden because of those kind of, I would call them orange fruits, but gold fruit, sometimes they're, they're more yellow. Questions about loquats? You mean because it drops foliage? You might not want to put it on a commercial landscape. Yeah, I mean, it's got kind of large leathery foliage and you can see it, it it'll drop foliage uh, during the summer is when it really drops its foliage. During the during the winter, it's it's pretty clean. So, but it does, you know, you can see it's it's dropping a little bit of foliage now. The fruits, you know, it honestly it doesn't fruit often <laughs> for us that that it's a real problem. I guess I guess it could be over walkways and things like that. They do have hard seeds. There's uh, and they haven't really been bred to have small or no seeds as far as I know. So you get usually about one to three seeds in the middle and, you know, fruit's about this big, the cluster of seeds about this big. So it's, it, it's probably as much seed as fruit, but they're bite size. You throw it all in your mouth and then you get to spit the seeds out. Is it one fairly shady spot like this or sun? No, um, well, this was sunnier when it was planted here. Trees have grown. Um, but uh, no, I, I've got this out in full blazing sun, this, this variegated one even in full sun, pretty dry soil and no problem at all. It'll, it'll fruit better in, in more sun. Well, it's pretty shady here. It gets a little bit of sun as the sun crosses, but you know, the sun is really going east to west here. And you can see from the trees behind me, it's, it's shaded most of the time. So I, I don't, that may be why we haven't gotten flowers and fruit on it. And to answer your, your unasked question, uh, <laughs> I have not had, uh, had deer really attacking it. I have had deer pulling it out of the ground when it's first planted, like tasting it and pulling it up, but they haven't been, they've, they've nibbled on it some, but not too bad. The question was, do we have deer in the Arboretum? We have had deer in the Arboretum twice since I've been here, and both times they've 
left on their own. Well, they like city life, but there isn't a really good uh, access point to the Arboretum. So um, the four foot fence around most of the garden does not keep them out. Uh, it's, it's really um, just, they're not moving in from other directions so much. Uh, the one time we, one of the times we had them in, in the Arboretum was when construction started on our, our border with 440. So they kind of pushed them out of the corridor they had been in and, and pushed them in here, but they left pretty quickly, thankfully. All right, we're gonna move right over here. So next plant here is uh, one of our natives. This is a, this is a JCRA introduction. Um, this is our native red cedar, which is not a cedar. Uh, this is a Juniperus virginiana, so a juniper. Um, one we named Silver Spear. Uh, we, we found this on the side of a road down in, um, I never can remember if it was North Florida or South Georgia. It was somewhere along that border and it really, it almost made me slam on my brakes. Uh, it it uh, keeps this really narrow upright form, which is something that the landscapers are always uh, looking for. And it's much bluer than the kind of standard in, in the trade, uh, which is Taylor, which is very similar, but upright. Uh, I showed this to our kind of the Area Nurserymen's Association, the, the Johnson County Nursery Association uh, folks who are, we work with on our Choice Plants program, and they absolutely flipped out on this. They really were excited. So uh, Juniperus virginiana is, is native um, all across the, the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, very, very drought tolerant, very sun tolerant, very abuse tolerant. Uh, so, so landscapers really, really like it that way. Um, these have been in the ground since, well, we collected cuttings in 2011. Not sure when we actually planted these out. Um, uh, but they've, uh, they've been great growers. What I found really exciting about uh, this is shortly after planting, I don't know what happened. Somebody sat on this one, uh, perhaps. And um, actually, I don't know if you can see, probably not from there, but it's got a pretty good crook in there. And um, Tim asked about, was gonna stake it. And I said, just leave it. I wanna watch and see what it does. Cause some plants won't fix themselves, if you will. But this was laying almost sideways. And you can see, it's probably why it's a little shorter than the other one, but you can see that it, um, it straightened itself up, which is great uh, for nurserymen. So they don't have to, to work so hard to, to um, stake it. We sent um, several thousand cuttings off uh, to be propagated. Most uh, uh, red cedar, Juniperus virginiana, is grafted onto Hetz juniper, Juniperus ex Hetzii. It's just standard, I don't know why. They're, they can be a little tricky to propagate from cuttings, uh, but I don't think they're that tricky. But we sent them off to a nursery that does that. Um, we, we took cuttings from our plants. We took cuttings from a plant that we had brought out to Juniper Level Botanic Garden. Uh, we gave them a, a five gallon plant we had in the nursery because they wanted to get as many as possible. And so um, really the goal is, is to have, they, they think they'll sell thousands and thousands of these. So um, pretty exciting introduction for them because it's a great native, real easy uh, to grow. It's like it looks a lot more narrow. Oh yeah, yeah. So we, we call this silver spear because of that bluish foliage and because it's so narrow. I mean, it was, when you drive down the road, if you look at, at the red cedars, you can see all kinds of shapes and sizes and things. This is narrower than any that I've ever seen before um, anywhere. So uh, we we're pretty excited uh, about it. There's another one. Brody. Um, Brody gets quite a bit wider, but it's nice and blue. Um, there, yeah, yeah, yes, very consistent. Um, one of the nice things about this is while it is fastigit, which means, which people think of as upright, fastigit really means the branches angle up. 
Uh, but this also, the branches tend to be very short. So you may get some splitting in, in uh, weather with some of these longer ones, but these shorter ones will, will really just bend down under you know, ice loads. So I think it's gonna be very good uh, uh, in, in that sense as well. Other questions? Yeah. Not yet, but it will be soon. We've distributed some. Um, you know, you might find them here and there. Um, uh, question was, is it a commercially available yet? I, I would think in, in two or three years, it, it will be available around Ra the Raleigh area. Um, and after that, I do think it's gonna be pretty widely available. Now it's a deep south form, so we really need to still see how cold hardy it is because it may not um, grow up into zone five, but zone six for sure. The species in general grow to, uh, you know, zone four, zone three. Um, it's, it's very cold tolerant. Um, is the, the white splash loquat commercially available? Um, Specialty mail order nurseries uh, will will sometimes have it. We sometimes offer it. Um, it roots fairly easily for us, so so it's just you can't get a whole lot of material off of one plant. Ours is finally getting to a size where we can take, you know, more cuttings. Question is how tall do these get at maturity? Um, the the plant that these came from was probably 25 feet tall. Um, they can get uh, Junipers virginiana can get quite tall uh, with a lot of time. The the ten year height is probably going to be uh, twelve to fifteen feet. Yeah, will this have a, will this um, maybe take the place of emerald arborvitae? Uh, it's it's got that same form. It will grow taller, uh, much quicker than than emerald arborvitae. Uh, so a little bit different usage perhaps. Um, but yeah, I would think it, it would, um, you know, certainly uh, fit in that same niche where somebody wants a narrow, upright plant. And as you mentioned, it is quite a bit more deer resistant than emerald arborvitae. Right? Not going to move far. Just right here. Right. It's another great native plant, uh, Silphium perfoliatum, sometimes called cut plant or resin plant. Um, Silphium comes from uh, a Greek word for a resin bearing plant. We don't quite know what that plant was, but um, it was a resin bearing plant. And then perfoliatum, uh, perfoliate, a perfoliate leaf is one that the stem comes up through the leaf. So the leaf's in the, the middle. Uh, and, and you can see that on here um, pretty distinctly. It's called cup plant because it holds water in there. So you'll often see birds coming in and drinking from there. Um, uh, little critters in there, like that little bug will hang out in there and birds will eat that as well as getting the water. It's very nice of it to rain last night, so you, I can show that. Um, this grows across much of the eastern U.S. Uh, real easy plant to grow. I got to admit, there are not a ton of, you know, what we call DYCs, damn yellow composites, uh, that that I like. You know, that, the the taxonomists call them that because, you know, somebody sends a picture of this flower and says, can you tell me what this is? And... Yeah, that's a DYC. Um, but this is pretty easy to identify. That's, that's why I like it. Uh, has a great presence, gets to be a big plant pretty quickly. You know, you can see it's a nice clump. It doesn't run, but it makes a big presence. And it flowers kind of midsummer and it'll keep going um, really all the way through fall. If you look at it, you can see it's just, the flowers are just opening. We don't even really have any that have gone over peak, um, but it's got tons of, of buds in here uh, that, are, that are getting ready to open. Uh, you can see it's got bees and other critters on there, great pollinator plant. Uh, so, so it's great for that in a long season um, for it. Uh, it's, it gets that, that silphium name, that resin bearing uh, kind of connotation because uh, if you cut the stems, there's this 
stuff that comes out uh, that people would chew, kind of like chewing gum. I've never actually tried it. One of these days I will, but um, I doubt it's that great. Uh, it's, it's used in a variety of purposes, but really it's a plant that uh, should be you know, available at every nursery. It's not, you can get it, but again, often through native plant nurseries or mail order nurseries, but it really is, I think, uh, a phenomenal um, garden plant. And while it wouldn't be in flower when people are buying their plants, which is always an issue, um, the foliage is interesting enough that, and bold enough that I think it would attract attention when people are, are doing it. Look at this, right on cue, there's the bee. So. Questions. How little sun can this take and still bloom? Um, it, this is a full sun plant. You really want six hours of, of good sun for it. It'll take pretty terrible soils. Doesn't want to stay wet, but it'll take pretty, pretty awful soils and do well, both sandy and heavy clay, as long as it isn't in a depression in that heavy clay. But yeah, it needs, it needs sunlight. Um, do deer eat it? As far as I know, not really. Um, a lot of these composites are, are pretty good about, are pretty um, deer resistant. And a lot of deer avoid this. It's got very scabrous or rough textured um, foliage. Uh, so, so that's something that deer avoid more often than not. Can you propagate it through seed or, or other ways? You, yes, you can propagate it from seed. Um, it pops up pretty easily. You can propagate it by division. Um, easier to do that during when, once it's you know, not up like this. Um, you can propagate it from cuttings, but uh, it's, it can be difficult. These real thick stems, uh, I haven't found propagate real well. You can do the thinner stuff, but once it starts flowering, it's really difficult. So you really got to get it early in the spring. Division and seed are gonna be the easiest ways to do it. Uh, how robustly does it volunteer once you have some in the garden? I've actually not seen it seeding around um, really at all. I, I, in part, uh, that's probably because it's not, to my mind, one of the more attractive uh, plants that are left up during the winter for winter interest. So when it's really, really full of seed, um, the foliage it starts getting pretty ratty and most of the time people cut it back so you're not getting a lot of seed. It may seed around more if you left it up all winter. So question, yeah, question about, you know, just reseeding plants in general like um, butterfly bush and, um, and some, some others that have become problems reseeding and do they uh, prefer uh, colder climates? Um, you know, I, I think that depends on the individual plant, um, you know, in England where they, they have, uh, you know, quite different weather. Some have problems with butterfly bush and rhododendron ponticum, which we struggle to grow because of our heat, the, the rhododendron ponticum. I think a lot of it is uh, in some cooler areas, there are less, there are fewer uh, uh, plants for birds to eat and move around. There, there's just a, a smaller variety of plants, and so there are more birds uh, eating the other plants that, that move them around. There's also less competition. You know, here in, in the southeast, things grow so quickly, and something like butterfly bush uh, really needs sunlight for the seeds to germinate. It's a, you know, it's a short-lived perennial, woody perennial plant. It, they don't really persist for a long, long time, like a tree or a, a, a boxwood or something. So they produce a lot of seed, and as when soil's disturbed, they'll pop up. So um, while they're a real problem in some places, a lot of times it's it's just the they're popping up in very visible places along roadsides, along uh, train tracks where people see them a lot. Uh, but in areas where it's densely vegetated, you don't see that so much. Um, but I think that if there's a bare spot in the southeast, it's covered pretty quickly with all kinds of things, which helps prevent that the seed from germinating. But I don't. I'm. I'm. You know, spitballing here. I don't. I don't know any real research on that. Is the pugster butterfly bush sterile? 
I am not 100% certain on that if it's being advertised as sterile or not. And the, a lot of the breeders don't like, the, the marketers like to say that the breeders don't necessarily, like the ones released from the Arboretum, like blue chip, are functionally sterile. They will, there are some ser, uh, fertile seeds, but in the order of, you know, thousands and thousands times less than uh, traditional butterfly bush. Other questions? All right. We'll keep on moving then. Should have gone more in shade, shouldn't I? All right. Our next plant here is uh, an agastache or agastache, um, one called Crazy Fortune. Uh, if you've grown uh, agastache for, for before, uh, you know that many of the, the types are they really don't like our high humidity. They don't like our moisture. They don't do well. The real exception to that are the, um, the, the funiculum, is that right? Funiculum, uh, types like blue fortune, uh, and, uh, blue boa and some of those, which do really well for us. Um, this one is a sport from Blue Fortune, hence the name Crazy Fortune. Uh, when we got this plant, I thought for sure it was going to revert quickly. Uh, you can see it has uh, this variegated foliage, kind of silvery, um, pale green center to it, uh, dark green margin, and then a thin white uh, uh, kind of lines separating them. Looks like the kind of thing that is just gonna revert like crazy. And especially herbaceous perennials that die back to the ground and re-sprout often, often revert. This has been just completely, completely uh, uh, solid plant for us. I, I went through and looked at our several clumps in here, tried to find a reversion on there and just could not find one at all. Um, it has not reverted. Uh, small flowers, not quite as showy as Blue Fortune. Um, it's it's past peak now, but enough flowers are there. You can see it's just covered with um, with bees all right now. They really love this thing. Uh, it will form new flowers, so when it really passes, and in another couple of weeks, if this was in my garden, I would give it a haircut down about halfway uh, and let it re-sprout and, and re-flush and re-flower for me um, just to get that second big burst of blooms. You don't really have to, but um, it's nice. Um, it needs full sun, well-drained soil. It's got that great uh, kind of uh, minty, anisey uh, fragrance, uh, which is, you know, one of those things that deer tend to avoid. I, I won't say for sure deer don't eat it, uh, but I can't imagine they do. Unlike a mint, it does not run. The, is, this is a big clump of it. Um, yeah, this is one plant uh, right here. So you can see it gets to be a pretty good size. Uh, super easy as long as you give it well-drained soil and lots and lots of sun. Questions? Mm -hmm. um, and this, uh, this type of variegation, this is a chimera. Uh, this um, is usually not heritable uh, or, or very heritable. Because of where it is, this should be a have variegation in the L2 layer, which means seed could possibly um, inherit this or, or some sort of variegation, but I have not seen it seed around at all. And, and I, Blue Fortune never really seeded around for me at all either. So, um, but again, easy, easy from cuttings, easy from, from division. So it's, it's pretty um, simple to make more of. We'll keep moving. Like I said, if you have questions about anything, just, just let me know. Oh, we'll go right here. This is kind of interesting. So we have here is a uh, calibracoa, kind of the mini petunias, um, but, but different than petunias. Calibracoa, this is one called Super Bell's Double Yellow. And if you look closely at the flowers, you can see they are double and yellow. Truth in advertising, not always something you get in, with plants. Um, this is sold as an annual. This was one that we had in our annual trials uh, a couple of years ago. Um, 
It uh, probably won't be long lived out here, but this was one that was planted uh, last summer, last June, uh, and made it through our winter, which was quite cold, uh, and just back and, and going great. We have some other ones in the garden, some other Calibracoa that have lasted for for several years out in the garden. So even though it's it's you know sold as an annual, some of these plants can persist uh, uh, multiple years. Some of these annuals that are really half-hearty perennials. So uh, they won't all Calibracoa don't do this, um, but some do, and that's why we plant some of these out in other places because we know that they might come back. Uh, so this is one that kind of surprised us though. Um, but it's real nice edging plant. Uh, you know, the Caliber Co are great for cascading over the edges of pots. Don't count on it coming back if you put it in a pot because it just, the roots are so much more exposed to, to the cold uh, that way. Um, but uh, makes a great, great little, little plant, neat and tidy and, and uh, great as an, as an edger. Is this bed getting supplemental water? No. Okay. So that's just yeah, this is this is a dry bed. These like it dry. Um, the one thing that will kill your your calibricoa and your petunias off are, uh, are are soils that are too wet. They really want to be um, want to be dry. No. So the question is: Is this the same thing right next to it? This is a, a lotus not like the lotus flowering the garden, uh, you know, in the water garden, but the true genus lotus, lotus corniculatus, um, which is another plant that's often sold as an annual to kind of cascade over the edges of pots. This is a cultivar called plenus, meaning double flowered. Uh, so it's got, it's got nice double flowers. Um, lotus corniculatus is a quite hardy plant in the bean family. Um, sometimes called, oh shoot, I can't remember common names for it. Um, but it's got these little three-part leaves, uh, beautiful green, and then it flowers kind of off and on uh, over the summer. It'll come in into flower and then kind of go out of flower and come into flower and go out of flower. This is um, just finishing up kind of one of those cycles, although it'll have some flowers kind of all, all season long. Plenus tends to keep flowering um, better uh, because it, it um, doesn't form seed because those double flowers uh, or it doesn't form seed well. Um, but real, you know, another really pretty plant. This one does spread quite, um, quite well if you want it to spread. It may clamber over your other plants if you don't want it to spread. I wouldn't plant it right by little tiny things, but you know, if we don't control it, it's going to grow over um, that little uh, heather right there. Um, but weaving around plants, it, it's great. It just, like I said, it will clamber up. So sometimes you got to, you got to, you know, keep it from going over and, and through plants. And it will root as it goes, so it does uh, spread. The calibracoas kind of all die back to the crown over, over the winter um, and then spread out. So they can get bigger each year uh, that they come back, but they're not spreading and spreading and spreading, whereas the, the lotus will. Yes. This is one of Denny Werner's questions. Is this one of Denny Werner's uh, butterfly bushes? Uh, this is a uh, pink microchip. So one of the real tiny um, pink ones. Like we were talking about, this is functionally sterile, uh, but great little plants. Uh, again, a butterfly bush tend to be short lived. So, you know, plant it and expect to replace it in every, you know, five to seven years. Uh, and, and usually it's a good thing that they are because they start to look kind of rough after, after too many years. The little dwarf ones keep, you know, stay looking better. Um, you were mentioning, asking about the pugster. Uh, you know, the pugster are great because they brought that dwarf size with, with a much larger uh, flower panicle. Um, really showy. Sometimes they look a little bit uh, lopsided to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. I, I really like pink microchip. I think this is one of the, the, the better dwarf ones. I could be um, prejudiced on that though, since it was released from the Arboretum. Uh, great question. Um, with, with 
typical butterfly bush, you often cut them back each year. That helps keep them alive longer because it kind of rejuvenates them. Um, with the, the, the little ones, do you do that? We don't. Um, the ones that are, have the really large flowers, trim those back. Um, this, if we had all the time in the world, we would trim all the, the old flower heads off and deadhead it, um, you know, while we were going, you know, if we kept, if we deadheaded it all season by taking these off, it would flower, it would be flowering even more heavily, uh, than it is right now. But, uh, that's a lot of work. Um, one of the nice things about these uh, functionally sterile ones is, you know, plants want to make seed. And so, and, and seed is very energy intensive to, to make. So if something flowers but doesn't actually make seed, um, that saves a lot of energy that goes into flowering because it's still trying to make seed. Uh, so, so you get a lot more, uh, you know, heavier flowering with these, these functionally sterile ones. Are these beneficial for pollinators? It really depends on the plant. Some of the dwarf ones uh, do are a great nectar source. Others are not as good a nectar source. Um, and I, uh, the the chips seem to be different. Blue chip uh, definitely is a good pollinator plant. The pink microchip I haven't really paid enough attention to uh, to tell. Because I don't see anything on that, and this is covered. Yeah, um, it, you know, it, 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 I don't know, uh, but but yeah, that, I'm seeing I'm seeing the same thing. Of course, Agastache is something that the the bees all. I mean, that's that's one of their favorites. So the question about um, these heaths here, Erica, uh, this little guy looks almost like a little dwarf conifer. Um, Although you can see, they're not all doing great. Um, the, the question was, what's the key to having them grow? The, the biggest key is only grow Erica, the, the hybrid, Erica X darliensis. Don't try and grow any other ones, because they'll die. Uh, Well-drained soil, lots of sun. They don't love our heat and humidity, but the darliensis seem to be the, the most tolerant of that. They're fairly short-lived for us, uh, but um, when, they're, when, they're in, when they're happy, they're beautiful. This is one called Kramer's Root. Uh, it's not quite, you know, it's, it's not open yet, um, but uh, it'll do well. We've grown the white and pink forms of, of Erica darliensis for years and years and years. Easy to propagate, so it's easy to make more because um, they are relatively short-lived for us. Yeah, they, these are all flower buds that are formed and they flower in, in winter. Yeah, in the, the okay, middle of winter. In themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like a little dwarf conifer. Okay. All right. Any other questions? We can stand here and just talk about plants the whole time. I'm going to talk about a couple of woody plants here. I'm going to stop far enough away that you can actually see them. Um, first we have here is an oak. Uh, let me grab a little bit of it because it's very un-oak like. This is one of my absolute favorite oaks. Um, it is uh, Quercus hypoleucoides. And the hypoleucoides uh, refers to the white backsides to the leaves. Really beautiful um, coloration. Uh, Quercus hypoleucoides is a uh, southwestern U.S., northern Mexico species. Uh, and uh, so, so you can see that kind of silvery and blue is very much a, a desert adaptation. So extremely, extremely drought resistant. Uh, I mean, look at it. That's why I love it. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. True four season plant in that in the spring, the new growth comes out and it's this beautiful pink. And then during the summer, you have these uh, dark green leaves and the silvery backsides looks really beautiful in, in the um, breeze. In the fall, in the winter, you have these beautiful leaves. So, you know, four seasons of beautiful leaves. Um, and one season where it's as good as any flowering tree in the, in the arboretum when that pink new growth comes out. It wants a well-drained soil. It wants lots of sun. Think of it as a desert plant. There are some 
some forms in cultivation that are really from pretty uh, uh, low elevation um, areas that don't get a lot of cold and they tend to be not as cold tolerant. But if you get good forms, it is really uh, uh, an outstanding, outstanding plant. We've had this here since uh, 2012, 2013, so um, about a decade. Uh, you can see the size it gets in a decade. What's that? Somebody who's better with heights. 20 feet, there you go. See, I would have said 30, but I think I'm six feet tall, so. Uh, but yeah, amazing plant. How hardy is it? Well, that's, that's it. It depends on the source. Uh, it depends on the provenance from it. Higher elevation um, sources uh, are much hardier. Uh, so, um, this plant uh, came from a, a wholesale place called Heritage uh, Nursery. Um, often you can get this from Cistus Design Nursery, and they specifically go collect higher elevation ones for that and propagate their higher elevation forms for hardiness. So um, it's it can be a solid zone seven plant. Um, but no, I don't think it's going to get 50 feet, you know, decade at, at 20 feet, you know, and like all trees, it's, they don't have, you know, well, they don't have a hard, hard limit, you know, in 50 years, maybe it's going to get, get larger, but typically in cultivation, it's 25 to 35 feet. Just thinking that it's yeah, um, but no, it's it's you know the, those desert oaks just don't don't get as big. They can't. There isn't enough water for that, and that's kind of genetically how they're how they're made. Now, in in the desert, it doesn't grow as nice as perfect to form. It doesn't get um, uh, you know quite as large as quick, uh, but it's uh, it still won't get overgrow a spot. And you know these are. These evergreen oaks are really, uh, really underutilized. Not just the, the southwestern ones, but the Asian ones on uh, Western Boulevard, uh, right um, back from the, the Arboretum. Um, if you look at the median, there's uh, Quercus mercenifolia planted along there. And they're beautiful, evergreen, small trees. Everybody drives by them and doesn't think about them, but they don't overhang the road. They don't get too big. They look great uh, all the time. Uh, and it's, it's a real shame that we don't grow more of those. These evergreen oaks are actually easier to propagate from cuttings than, than others, easier from acorns, but these um, are much easier than, than um, other, uh, other oaks to, to propagate without grafting. Um, and you know, this would be beautiful as a, as a uh, street tree. Uh, ring, cup. ring cup oak that kind of kind of applies to all of the cyclobalanopsis type. So that ring cup can refer to Quercus glauca, although that's often called Japanese blue oak. Um, but Quercus mercenifolia, and that's probably the hardiest of the Asian ones, followed by Quercus glauca. But they're gorgeous plants. I'm assuming that they were planted by the the city, the late city horticulturist Noel Weston, but I'm really trying to figure out when they were planted. If anybody remembers when they were planted, let me know. I've been in touch with the city, with the parks, with the grounds folks, and nobody really knows. Everybody assumes Noel Weston planted them, but because um, nobody else would have. I was wondering if it was the Arboretum. Uh, they came from the Arboretum, but. I just don't know. Sure. The question is, would this do something like this do well in like a parking lot where it bakes and it's dry? And and the answer is yes. Um, now, you know, you have to get them up to landscape size. And, and one of the issues is, you know, you've got that little planting space because they want to get as many parking spaces as possible. So they've got a parking space two feet away from this, but really, it's taken it 12 years here to get that much height under the canopy. And so the specs for a parking lot are usually, uh, you know, they want six to eight feet of 
of clearance before planting it at all. Um, or they just plant fastidiate things, which defeat the purpose because they don't really provide any shade at all. Uh, so that's the problem. You'd have to get somebody, and I don't know, I think probably in production, you could get a good sized tree that would, that would work um, in a reasonable amount of time by watering it and pushing it as a young plant. Um, the, the comment was that parking lots they sometimes top all the trees so you can see the, the sign on the building from the road and they don't want to obscure that. And so they may want something that doesn't get too big. Yeah, you know, they, they want something that, that is high enough you can get under, doesn't need any care, doesn't get too tall, stays in perfect shape, never has a dying branch. You know, there are very few plants like that. Yeah, comment was a, a great um, a great maple for that is trident maple, Acer bergerianum, and yeah, that those are very tough. Uh, South Glenwood uh, Street, they've got um, trident maples planted out, and those survive uh, outside all the bars where you got all the drunk college students and recently graduated drunk college former college students. Um, and and they do well there. They don't get too big. They look great year round. Um, yeah, they're much better than than some of our our native red maple and things like that. Yeah, for sure. All right, I'm going to shift just a little bit over. Talk about the oricaria. Uh, this is a hybrid oricaria. Oricaria oricana, hybridized with oricaria and gustifolia. Oricaria oricana uh, is a is a terrible plant for us because it gets root rot. If you were to pile up a bunch of, of mostly sand and a little bit of soil and plant this at the top with perfect drainage and uh, Oricaria oricana, maybe it would survive. And Gustafolia is not quite as hardy, but it is um, uh, it is more root rot resistant. So these, this is a hybrid, these are F2 hybrids. So it means they're seedling from uh, that cross. So they're not that cross, they're seedlings from that. Uh, it's been out here for a decade. Uh, so this is, Arcaria is the same family as Norfolk Island Pines. And these are kind of, they grow, both of these parents grow in South America uh, kind of Oricana region of South America, but they also grow uh, in, uh, or Oricaria are native to uh, Australia and some of the islands like Norfolk Island, which is, is down there. Um, just a great textural plant. Uh, and this does uh, form cones. It's a conifer. It forms cones and the cones are the size of a large grapefruit and solid as can be. So this would not make a good parking lot tree because it would, uh, it's one of those plants that probably kill you if they fell. Unfortunately, none of our cones ever have seed. So we really need another one to try and get them to cross because I think that they're, um, they're not self-incompatible. It's just that like many, um, many, uh, 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 conifers, the male uh, stroboli, male flowers, uh, flower either at a, a little bit earlier, typically, or they, they're below the female flowers, uh, which form the cones. And so the pollen doesn't go up to those cones um, very well anyway. Uh, and, and so you need multiple plants so the wind will blow the pollen over to another plant and vice versa. Um, but a really neat tree. Um, if you really want to make it look good, get, you can go in there with some, some snips and cut off those old, that old foliage because it will stay in there, that orange foliage, uh, for years and years and years. Um, but you will also uh, lose a lot of blood because it is a vicious spiny plant. I did, as a gardener, have to go up on a ladder to clear uh, uh, Oricaria oricana out um, because the person who's uh, who named the building that it was in front of really didn't like it. That was planted um, 2012, 2014, some, somewhere in there. I can't, can't remember exactly, but it's, it's uh, right at a, a decade or so old. And it actually fell, 
fell over one time. We had to pull it back up and strap it to the lath house behind it. And I thought we were gonna lose it for sure. And it rebounded like, like with no problem. Any other questions? Unrelated question. How, how, have the Mangabis been there through the winter? No. Have the Mangabis been here through the winter? Um, I don't believe any of these have. Um, we've got several different ones in here, including this this big guy in the back. Kaleidoscope definitely has it. That's not hardy at, at all. Um, this one, uh, Mission from Mars. I don't believe this one has been, um, but this has got a lot more agave blood in it, so it is much stiffer than than the the earlier mangaves it's got vicious points it's it's much more like an agave um, and so some of those tend to be more hardy what's what's interesting with the mangave these are agaves crossed with manfrida and manfrida is basically a herbaceous agave it, it dies back to the ground we have native mangave i mean excuse me native manfrida uh here in north carolina um on the east coast but the agave that were used, especially early on with the mangave, were the subtropical and tropical species. And the reason for that is because pollen was available. It wasn't because that was what was desired. Um, but as these have gained popularity, and it was found that this was possible, uh, more recent um, uh, plants have been have been crossed with uh, our hardier agave because um, early on it was really like can we actually do this and so with the mangave uh, with the manfreda you have the speckles and spots on the leaves and more coloration so you bring that into agaves and the goal in large measure is to have basically agaves with with spots so you take something like frosty blue agave ovatifolia and we are basically we're going to have pretty close now hardy spotted agave like this um i don't know if that's an improvement on <laughs> this this is one of the you know frosty blue is about as good as you get um I'm, I'm cringing for the day when it sends up that flower stalk and it's probably going to be in the next couple of years we're going to get a flower stalk and lose this amazing plant but that's okay yeah so question was you don't really know how long it's going to be before the agave before an agave starts flowering and, and dies um yeah so depending on the species and depending on the commit conditions an agave can take 10 years to 50 years, 60 years to flower. Uh, they flower in general much quicker for us in the, the east than they do in the in desert climates. That's why they're called century plants because it takes so long for them to bloom in desert environments. But with more water, they grow faster and will bloom earlier. Now with the mangave, uh, one of the nice things is that they flower, you know, once they get old enough, they'll flower every year. Excuse me, with the manfreda the Manfreda parent, uh, that flowers yearly. So you do have the possibility of uh, having, uh, instead of having uh, one flower stalk and then the plant dies on an agave, perhaps you would, you would uh, decrease that monocarpic um, tendency and have it flower more regularly. I don't know that that's really possible or not, but it may make them sterile so they won't flower at all. I, we haven't been, they haven't been around long enough to really know that. So this is just a comment, but the post, you're sure, and yep. um, God, it just looks fabulous. <laughs> I color coordinated to end right here with between the posts and the frosty blue with, with this shirt. That was, that was all, uh, all uh, intentional. And I will say, I'm kind of embarrassed because the other posts around here with our, our fantastic uh, ephemeral arts committee, but that one is mine. How long will these posts be up? Good question. 
Um, I don't know. We'd have to talk to the Ephemeral Arts Committee. They will be up at least through Moonlight in the Garden, so at least through November, probably through through the winter. And um, and we've got some ideas for different uh, ephemeral art projects. Uh, if anybody would like to participate in those type of art projects, um, or at least be aware of them, uh, so they can if they want, uh, get in touch with uh, our volunteer coordinator, uh, Catherine Wall. And thank y'all all for coming out in the hot sun.